greetings in Jesus' name. Um, I hope you all are doing well. As uh, things heat up in the Middle Ages, um, of course, there is much discussion about Gog and the God, and also um, you know, the Psalm 83 war, and uh, whether or not this is what's going on. Um, regardless of, of where we come down on any of that, what commonly has been taught over the years, and, and uh, I've heard this much myself uh, from various pastors and, and uh, Bible teachers, and it's been in a few books and articles. And um, so because it's so broadly taught, um, I have passed on the same information. And um, then in the course of more recent events, been taking a harder look at exactly what's going on with the Gog and Magog war. So let me say this. Um, usually in the Gog and Magog discussion, what comes up is um, a discussion regarding Israel and that how one of the qualifications or con conditions for Israel at that time is that Israel would stand alone. Israel would find herself all by herself with no support. And um, ultimately that might be the case. But what I'm reading in scripture is that that ain't gospel. That isn't necessarily so. God will divinely intervene. He will step in and miraculously um, deliver them. But the passage that comes up most often regarding Gog and Magog that people seem to quote from is from Zechariah 12. So um, let's take a quick look at Zechariah 12. I've got it open here. The burden of the word of the Lord against Israel. Thus says the Lord who stretches out the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against, Ju against Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all nations of the earth are gathered against it. So, here we do have all the nations of the earth gathered against it, and how that um, Jerusalem is a burdensome stone. Everybody wants it, but good luck carrying it off or heaving it or whatever you want to try to do. Um, so it talks about surrounding peoples, laying siege, and so forth. So we'd read that and we'd say, "Oh, if, you know, if that's what's going on now, yeah, that would be that would be true." And it and uh, and it does say that. You know, all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem, if it happened that in that day, and there's that language about in times, that day or in those days or at that hour in the latter days, that kind of language comes up frequently regarding the very end. They'll surely be cut to pieces. In verse 3, though all nations of the earth are gathered, gathered against it. Hmm, that looks like Israel standing alone. Well, let's keep reading, though, and see if this is really what we're talking about here with Gog and Magog. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength, and the Lord of hosts their God. In that day I will make the governors of Judah like a fire pan in the woodpile, and like a fiery torch in the sheaves. They shall devour all the surrounding peoples on the right, uh, on the right hand and on the left, but Jerusalem shall be inhabited again by uh, in her own place, Jerusalem. And then verse 7, The Lord will save the tents of Judah first, so that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall not become greater than that of Judah. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David, and the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord, before them, which is probably a reference to Messiah, the angel of the Lord, Christophany. 
It shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And, verse 10, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they have pierced. Yes, I will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Let's keep going. Verse 11. In that day, there shall be a great morning in Jerusalem, like the morning at Hadad, Ramon, in the place in the plain of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, and the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, the house of Phinei by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, their wives by themselves. But the part I want to highlight is that this is going on in the plain of Megiddo. The Gog and Magog War is something that happens. They come up against Jerusalem, and that's a completely different war. Gog and Magog is not the valley of Megiddo or the plain of Megiddo where we have Armageddon. So this is speaking of the very end of the Great Tribulation. This is when all the armies of the world have gathered in Megiddo. And so here, and it makes sense because it mentions you know, all the armies, all the nations coming up against Jerusalem, against Judah, against Israel. This is not the case where it comes to Gog and Magog. Let's take a quick look there. Ezekiel 38. Look again, we have it nice and big. Ezekiel 38, Gog and allies attack Israel. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Ross, or Rus, as some translations say, Meshach and Tubal, which would be Turkey, Rus, or Ross, is uh, to the extreme north, getting up there toward the Netherlands and Finland and all that, and prophesy against him, saying, This says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O God, the prince of Ross. Meshach and Tubal, I will turn you around and put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your armies, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, which is Iran, Ethiopia and Libya are with them, which is North Africa, and all of them with shields and helmet, Goma and all its troops, the house of Tagarma from the far north, and all its troops, many people, are with you. Not everybody is with you. See, that's different than we have in Zechariah 12 with Armageddon. Armageddon, everybody. Here it's many people. And there's some, a very specific cadre of folks who are coming up against them. And in this case, too, thus says the Lord, behold, I'm against you. Um, I will turn you around. So the Lord is doing this. This is going to be part of his judgment um, upon these nations and probably judgment upon Israel too for a moment. Uh, it's not permanent as we see in um, other passages and including in the future here. Verse 7, prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you, and be a guard to them. After many days you will be visited in the latter years. So this confirms that this all happens in the latter years, in the latter days, or in that day. You will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people in the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, and it was a desert land before 1948. It was a desolate place. It was just completely desert. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. So we have Ezekiel, the previous chapters, out. Let's see, um, chapter 36 and 37. So you have the dry bones prophecy, for instance and the Lord um, bringing Israel back into the land. So it says, You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops, and many peoples with you. Again, not everybody, but many people. So, we're on the mountains of Israel. So we're coming up over the West Bank, it looks like, too, surrounding Jerusalem, most likely. 
Uh, thus says the Lord God, on that day you shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And Israel has no bars or gates or walls, and it is unwalled villages. People sometimes point to walls and fenced in areas and say, look at, see, that all has to come down first uh, before Israel can be attacked and you can have the Gog and Magog war. Well, actually, this is not true. Israel is surrounded mostly by wire fences. I mean, you could drive your Toyota through it. <laughs> you know, you get up enough speed and you can crash through it. But as we saw with the invasion that happened in October 7th, um, Hamas had to use tractors and so forth to lift up and to push out of the way um, walls that were there because the places that are walled and the villages that are walled are not Israel villages. These are Palestinian so-called villages. Now, the, the, the West Bank has a wall around it and so does Gaza. Those are the only walls and those are for them and to kind of control and maintain them for the very reasons we see today because um, they can't be trusted and to kind of control where folk, folks come in and where they go out, again, for the reasons that we see presently. So, um, and, and the reason why they're there, verse 12, to take plunder, to take booty, to stretch out your hand against uh, the waste places that are again inhabited, and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired lost livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba and Dedan, uh, which would be um, the Saudis, for instance, the merchants of Tarshish. There's some dispute over that, and their young lions. Some dispute over that, but, but many historians say Tarshish, you're talking about over there, that is mostly what you'd call Great Britain, um, the British Isles, and, their, and all their young lions. The young lions would be those who came out of the offspring, if you will, from Tarshish, which would be everything from... Uh, New Zealand and Australia to Canada, the United States, um, and um, who knows, perhaps other places like India will not um, necessarily be in, involved directly, but they will say this. They will say to you, verse 13, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Um, no, I'm so what are you doing there? But we see that they're not necessarily directly involved, but they are saying this. But it doesn't say that they are not involved. It just says that this is what they're going to say. Um, even now, the United States is there in, supp in supplying support and so forth. Uh, we don't know how long the United States is going to stay involved in, under the current administration. Um, there's a lot of uh, glad handing going on with Iran, for instance. Um, you will embrace Israel, will embrace Netanyahu. Uh, meanwhile, handing off millions and even billions of dollars to Iran or Persia. So there's a lot of talking out of both sides of the mouth going on. Um, so let's continue to see where it says something about Israel standing alone, where they'll find themselves alone in the Gog and Magog war. We already see they find themselves surrounded by all the nations surrounding them in the Megiddo, in Armageddon, but this is different. This is some very specific nations. Verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to God, This says the Lord God, On that day will my people Israel dwell safely. Will you not know it? But then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. So it could be that we've got Psalm 83 because those are the close-in um, nations, tribes, what have you, that are mentioned in Psalm 83. And so that could be the start of where we are right now. And right on the heels of that, if I could put it that way, you might have Isaiah 17, 1, where Damascus is destroyed and becomes a city no more. Um, because more and more um, they are being named as a, as a potential target 
Syria and Lebanon for allowing Hezbollah and uh, Iran through them to attack Israel. So it could be that all these things are speaking of uh, the same basic time frame, the same basic war and it builds to this point here who you've got uh, before um, Psalm 83, you've got specific close-in nations like Gaza and other surrounding areas. Um, Libya, for instance, involved and others are, are getting involved and uh, Hezbollah and Hamas are coming from those lower nations and from the sides and, and also outwardly for their um, providing support even in uh, with Hezbollah out of Lebanon. Hamas is still involved there. So here, although uh, we've got it building, we've got it building, this is up, and, uh, you will, verse 16, come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will, I will bring you against my land. See, so the Lord is doing this. This is his judgment. They're doing it. Thoughts come in their mind, in God's mind, um, and they devise a plan, but God is the one doing it. Kind of like Pharaoh, think of, in uh, Egypt back in the day when the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Let my people go, but the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart. And um, so this is this is the way this happens. It's, uh, you know, Gog might think it's his own free will and is coming up with this idea on his own, but there's the hook in the jaw. The Lord says, I will lead you. I'm going to lead you by the nose. Um, it would be in the line of birth, verse 16, that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hollowed in you. So he will be hallowed um, in you, O Gog, before their eyes. So they're going to be gobsmacked. They're going to they're going to be amazed um, when they see the deliverance of Israel, Jerusalem, and uh, God intervenes on their behalf. Uh, verse seventeen. Thus says the Lord God: Are you he of whom I have spoken in my in our former days? by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. So this is what God says to Gog. And here's the judgment of Gog. Um, so this army, goes, this army, this war goes on and builds to a point. Um, and God has led them there. And we now have more nations involved. And likely at this point, this is a world war. Then in verse 18, and this gets really interesting. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel. So not necessarily where we're at right now, but when it gets to the point where it is the Gog and Magog war and you see those nations from the great north and you know Russia and Turkey and everybody else jumping and getting involved, we see pictures of God, but when we see Gog, who's the leader coming from the north, when he sweeps down through at that time, says the Lord, that my fury will show in my face. So here we have the wrath of God. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely on that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So they're going to kind of turn against each other. And some of that's kind of going on now where they're not paying attention to whether they're shooting or whatever. And sometimes they, they hit each other. So here, at some point during this World War III, that uh, it officially becomes the wrath of God. I mean, this compares very well with uh, the results, the fallout from these. It's the same Six. So you read some of the things that are stated here, and it reads, <clears throat> excuse me, it reads very much like Revelation six in the seal judgments. That the seal judgments are recording the fallout of all of this um, in these events, and it is wrath. See, uh, so God is saying, "My wrath, I have spoken," in verse nineteen. So to be clear. Um, the church is not supposed to be here during wrath. Uh, we see this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And uh, we also see this in Revelation 3.10. 
that though there's going to be trouble that comes upon the whole world, so world war, um, that Jesus says, because you've been faithful, I'm going, to, I'm going to keep you from that time that happens upon that trouble, that happens upon the whole world, that will come upon who? Those, not you, those who dwell upon the earth. There are them that dwell upon the earth. So, if we're not on the earth and we're not those who are coming um, or living on the world at that time, how is that going to happen if, if we're still here? It says that he's going to keep us from it. And it means uh, in the Greek, terio ek, uh, I completely removed out of the way from any of this happening. So that means the rapture really has to happen before we get to this point, before we get to verse 18. Um, when it comes to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel. Same war. Clearly it's the same war. But at some point it reaches a threshold. And uh, we will be removed from the earth before that happens. So how long the war is going to go on and how long it goes before God says, all right, that's it. You know, you're done picking on my people. His fury is going to show in his face and the fire of his wrath. Um, boom. Big earthquake and he levels everything. So what happens? Um, as I recall from our soul, verse 21, against God throughout all my mountains, says the Lord, every man's sword will be against his brother and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. Again, that matches the sealed judgments in Revelation 6, I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. This I will magnify myself and sanctify myself or set myself apart from anybody else, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. It doesn't say all nations, but it does say many nations. They shall know that I am the Lord. Now notice it does not preclude the young lions of Tarshish. In other words, it could be other allies, the United States, anybody. It does not preclude anybody from necessarily being there and being involved with Israel at that time. Um, nothing says that that cannot be the case. Um, that's an assumption that we've picked up from former Bible teachers in the past. Who knows? Maybe Hal Lindsey. You know, like we're planning on, and, and uh, you know, other Bible teachers like him, but we don't find it in Scripture. If you do find it, you may have a place that we need, but Zechariah 12 is Armageddon at the end of the tribulation. This year will be the beginning of the tribulation, and we're taken out right before that, or right at the beginning. So, um, you tell me. This is the way I understand it, though. I'm just looking at. Uh, watching and looking at what Bible actually says and trying to keep it biblical, trying to keep it in context, trying to keep it true to the word, uh, whatever this does to whatever rapture theories people might or might not have um, concerning the end. Um, regardless, we have to, we have to um, sort it together with the scriptures we have here, and it must be subjective. Whatever our ideas and notions are, have to be subjective to what we read in the text here, whether it's Zechariah 12 or Ezekiel 38. If you uh, comment below, let me know um, what you think. If you have another verse or passage that I've missed that says that they will stand alone at this time, and um, it's potential for narrowing it down to God and Magog, then great. But meanwhile, please like, subscribe, and um, I'm, I try not to overwhelm uh, my channel here with a, a lot of uh, videos that are just talking just to talk. If I've got something significant or important to say or to remark on, or um, I have a challenge like this, I'll do it. But I, I don't necessarily, I don't always get on here just to chit chat. Maybe I will someday, but I just I don't, that's just not me, that's not what I do with this channel, with this channel, I, try, I just try to like to um, remind us all to just keep it biblical, 
Let's just keep it biblical. And I'm willing to admit, hey, I was I was wrong. I got I got this part wrong because I just keep carrying forth the same bad teaching that I had for who knows how long ago in the past and uh, repeating the same bad information that, no, Israel has to stand alone here. So, hey, as long as the United States is in the mix, as long as Great Britain's in the mix here, um, nope, this, this isn't it. This isn't Gog and Magog. Well, guess what, folks? What we see going on right now in the Middle East could be Gog and Magog. Nothing in here precludes other from people from being involved. What is going to happen is God is going to miraculously intervene and a great earthquake and rain fire down. It doesn't say on everybody. It says against Gog and the nations, the peoples that are uh, many peoples, many peoples with you, verse 15. All of them riding horses, a great company, and a mighty army. So uh, Hezbollah, uh, Turkey, Iran. So let's see what God does. Um, we can say with this text, raining fire and brimstone down, we could um, say that that might mean nuclear war. Uh, you know what God is doing? It's just like moving God down there into the land is God doing it because and guess what? God is sovereign. He does as he pleases. And God could lead Israel or the United States or another nation to um, drop some nukes over the great army that takes out God and his armies. Um, he can do whatever he wants. Or just take it um, very literally and just say that maybe God, you know, with the big earthquake, cracks the ground open and all kinds of magma spews up into the air and, and pours down on those armies. Um, you know, we just, we just don't know. It, it, at this point, that part of it would be uh, guesswork. Um, make it this what you will, but I'm just telling you what to what to watch for. Um, then don't forget when you're reading this and you're reviewing whatever I have to say here, uh, of course, to go on to chapter 39, because chapter 39 is the continuation, some of the aftermath of uh, the destruction of Gog and his armies. Gog is destroyed on the hills outside of Jerusalem. So that army is still going on, and um, then there's a lot that happens. There's some timeline markers in here, durations and so forth, like burning weapons for seven years. That's why I say this matches, one of the reasons why I say this matches the seal judgments of Revelation 6, because Burning weapons for seven years. It makes sense afterwards that the Antichrist was one of the uh, four horsemen identified at the beginning of uh, chapter six of Revelation. Um, he could be around. Gog is destroyed, and this is the great opportunity for the Antichrist, the false Messiah, to step in and he's going to make peace. He's going to settle everything down, make everybody happy, and he's going to. Build the temple for uh, Israel. So he's going to be the big hero, the big man, and um, introduce peace, peace, a false peace. Then Christ can come in and, and, and build a false peace and be the big hero. And uh, Revelation chapter 6 is a great opportunity for him to do that. And, um, and so then we have. Um, That's right. Putin. Going on to Zechariah chapter 13 and Zechariah 14, we have a remnant of Israel that is uh, saved and, and leaves and goes up into the mountains, Petra or wherever, and hides out. And it's just a remnant of Jerusalem and a remnant from Israel. Um, and some will remain behind and keep burning the weapons as fuel with some technology or other. Um, and the Lord will not need that in his kingdom at, after the tribulation. So um, that's why this looks like this is at the beginning, seven years of burning weapons. And then at, at the end of the tribulation, we've got the kingdom. Jesus will not be needing a carbon footprint of a 
some futuristic massive uh, iron that with whatever technology Israel uses to burn weapons as fuel. Um, he won't need that in the, in the kingdom on earth. So um, anyway, thoughts, comments before? I do have other Gog and Magog uh, videos listed down below. Uh, if, if you go down below too, you can find um, playlists and um, or you can list all the videos and you'll find some more Gog and Magog. But um, but this is this is the one thing I have to diverge from and just say I was wrong about that. There's nothing that says Israel will stand alone and have no assistance at all during the Gog and Magog War. So now that spices up our viewing um, with rapt attention what's going on in the Middle East today. So again, thanks. Comments below. Happy Google.